Okay, so continuing on chapter seven. They lapse into silence and walk for a silent 15 minutes before Scoob realizes he's missing a golden opportunity to get some of his questions asked. A bird crows overhead like, go ahead, dummy. So Scoob clears his throat. <clears> throat> uh, was that my dad who called? Jima waves a hand as if she was swatting away a fly. Oh, that old sourpuss. You'd think the man had a very unhappy childhood the way he behaves sometimes. Well, what did he say? Nothing important, Jima replies. She stops to pull something out of her pocket, and Scoob almost poof, smacks right into her. Up into the air, her hand goes, and she rotates this way and that. She's holding a compass, which, once she picks a final direction, she turns to she returns to her pocket. Then she licks her index finger and puts it just above her head. Okay. This way, she says, leaving the trail and heading straight into the forest. Scoob doesn't move. He looks left and right, up and down. From where he's standing, he can see the sky and a well-trod path, no matter which way he follows. Where's Jima at, though? The tree canopy is so thick. It basically looks like it's night in there. That's not not to mention all the fallen branches and raised tree roots waiting to trip him. Huh, one still painful arm gash is enough. Or the snakes waiting to bite him. Or the bears waiting to eat him. Well, come on, you diddle-daddle, Grandma yells. She's a hot one, isn't she? From wherever she is. That camo outfit is working too well for Scoob's liking. He gulps. Um, hey, maybe we should stick to the path, Jima, he shouts back. It's there for a reason. Don't be a goose, she replies. Better to be in here than out there in the open where the grizzlies can see a plain as day. Then there's a cackle that echoes so menacingly Scoob could swear it ends. It sends a shudder through the treetops. He inhales extra deep. What the heck was he thinking letting Jima drag him out into the Mississippi wilderness? This is the same lady who tackled him that one time they were playing baseball in her backyard as he tried to block her from reaching first base. Ha! Sounds like my kind of Jima. Sorry, repositioning my arm. He takes a deep step into the woods. Where are you, Jima? he shouts. Follow the sound of my voice, he hears her shout. That's Survival 101. Use all your available senses. If you can't see something, you got to be able to figure out where it is by other means. In this case, use your hearing. She goes quiet. Uh, uh Jima? Nothing. Scoob starts to sweat. He knows she's somewhere in front of him, but he wasn't listening carefully enough to tell if she's to the right or to the left. Considering how tightly packed these pines, which look suspiciously like towering dragon giants at this moment, are moving even the slightest bit in the wrong direction could be disastrous. Jima was probably, hopefully, kidding about the grizzlies, but still, he does not want to get eaten. The trail is right behind him. He could hop into it and trek right back to the RV, which, relative to his present surroundings, is the world's lushest palace, full of what Dad would call first world luxuries. All he'd have to do is shout to let Jima know he's headed back. He has to pee super bad or something. Then again, knowing her, she would just tell him to pick a tree. Sidebar. I'm sorry, but this is a lot of potty talk, and this is really making me laugh. Back to the story. Then again, so he'd also be leaving her alone out there to be eaten. Ooh, he's getting a little mad at her now for putting him in this predica. Caw! Caw! Definitely not a bird, and definitely a bit ahead and to his right. Scoob steals himself and heads in what he hopes to be high heavens, as Dad likes to say when he's being more over the top than usual, is the right direction. 
he finds Jima standing in a small clearing with her veiny little fists on her hips, just beaming like Scoob won a gold Olympic medal for not dying in a scary forest, which should definitely be a real sport. It's way harder than running around in a circle. Scoob should know. He went out for track last year. boy," she says. Scoob rolls an acorn around with the toe of his sneaker. Thanks, I guess. Now, come on over here, she says. It's high time you learn to build a fire. And this is when Scoob actually takes a gander at their surroundings. The open space he and Jima are standing in appears to be some sort of a campsite. There's even a pot smack in the center where a bunch of medium to large rocks have been arranged in a very haphazard ring. Reminds Scoob of the brick fire pit at the edge of Shanice and Drake's backyard. You knew this place was here, Jima, huh? Scoob says. I did once I found it she says as she starts walking around the outer edge of the space, peeling off what looks like curls of paper from some of the trees as she goes. She also plucks up handfuls of brown grass. Set your bag down and start gathering up some twigs and any dead leaves you see, will ya? Uh, okie doke. And make sure they're dry. You can make a pile right in the center of that fire pit right there. As Scoop sets about his task, his mind returns to all the things he doesn't want to know, but wants to know, like who or what Dad was talking about. Keep an eye out for some good sticks and fallen branches, too, scuba Doob. And if you see any good hunks of wood, bring them over as well. Now Scoop's thinking about Shanice and how this one time she climbed a huge tree in the woods behind Jima's house in search of the perfect jousting stick. She had watched some old movie called A King in King Ar A Kid in King Arthur's Court and became obsessed with it. The injustice of the lack of girl nights. Problem was, she got up so high she freaked. Scoob had to climb up to be a prototypical knight and lead her back down. Then literally an hour later in those same woods, Scoob fell into a creek and she had to save him. Scoob and Shanice always had each other's backs. And fine, Scoob had begun to see her in a different way, which is why he did what he did when Bryce pushed things too far with Drake and seemed to be threatening her. Why couldn't Dad just understand that? How's it going? Grandma is now bent over the ring of rocks, arranging the tree paper and grass and some of the twigs and leaves. Scoob piled in the center. He looks at the handfuls of sticks he's holding. No idea why he picked up so many. Uh, fine, I guess. Come on over here. Let's see what you got. Scoob does as he told. And S Scoob does as he's told. And when Jima sees what's in his hands, she claps and bounces on her little Jima toes. All right, come over here. Come over here. Let me show you how it's done. Scoob brings his sticks over. Then she makes him squat down to watch as she arranges them into an upside down cone-like thing, which makes Scoob think of ice cream. There's something about tinder and kindling and oxygen. And then she's arranging some bigger hunks of wood that come from who knows where and pulling a box of super long matches out of Scoob's bag. Well, well how did, that, did they get in there? Sizzle, crackle, pop. And there it is, a fire. Whoa, Scoob says as it catches in earnest. Bet you didn't know your Jima had them kind of tricks up her sleeve, did ya? She puts a hand on her lower back and straightens up slowly. Oh, look, Stella has come to listen to the story. Say hi, Stella. Oh, she doesn't want to say hi. Anyway, I lost my place. Um, Scoob, let's see. I'm so sorry, guys. Hold up. Slowly. So it reminds Scoob of her former attic door, 
had to push it a little harder than with all the other ones, and it always groaned as it opened, like it was annoyed at being bothered. Not as nimble as I used to be, but this old bird can still start a damn darn good fire. Scoob just stares into the flames, because learning the new thing about Jima just makes his head spin around all the other new stuff that he's learned. I tried to teach your daddy how to do this when he was a kid, she goes on, but he wanted no part of it. He's never been the outdoorsy type. She plants her hands on her hips again, and now she's staring into the flames as though searching for something. Scoob recognizes the question asking opportunity. Hey, was he mad when he called this time, he asks. He's always mad, kiddo. She can say that again. But why? <sighs> Grandma just sighs, which makes Scoob's dad question bubble up and overflow. Why is he so hard on me? Why doesn't he listen? Why is nothing I ever do good enough? Why doesn't he understand me? Why doesn't he give me a break? Scoob's eyes prickle, but there's no way he's going to cry right now. He grits his teeth to keep the t tears from coming. Jima's staring at him now. Come on over here and have a sit down, she says. Actually, help me down first. She reaches out her arms to him. You sure about that, Jima? What he doesn't say is, are you going to be able to get up? Yeah, I'm sure. Scoob takes, uh, sorry, Jima takes Scoob's hands and slowly lowers herself to the ground. Now, hand me that trinket box from your bag. And then you sit with your back against mine, so we are both supported. Scoob complies. Behind him now, he hears the creak of Jima's treasure box, and then she's passing him something over her shoulder. It's a black and white photo in a plastic sleeve of a white man leaning against a super old school car with his arms crossed. Scoob turns it over. The back has Clyde Alexander, 1952, written on the top right corner and what looks like the image of Texas cut out from a map. There is a city, Kent, circled in the west of the state, not too far from the Mexican border. That's my daddy, Jima says. Gave me that photo right before he hopped in that Chevy and took off. I was nine years old. Whoa. He was my whole world up till that point, so you can imagine how it affected me. I'd overheard him talking about Kent, Texas, so I figured that's where he's gone. I'm the one who added the cutout to the back of the photo. But my mama would never confirm it or deny it, despite my pestering her mercilessly. I knew she knew where he had run off to and why, but she wouldn't tell me a single thing. That sure sounds familiar. I wouldn't leave well enough alone, though, Jima continues. Kept digging and digging until I discovered some things about my daddy I'd have been better off not knowing. Like what? Scoob feels Jima sigh against his back. Well, he wasn't as good a man as I thought he was, scuba -Doo. Did a number of awful things and hurt a lot of people. How so? In a word, he was a crook. Oh, it's possible to know too much about the folks in your life. Your daddy's always mad because he knows too much about your mama, about his daddy. At least he thinks he knows about his daddy. She sighs again. Hmm. Anywho, finding out these things about my father at such a young age, well, we'll just say there is a whole lot I wish I could unlearn. It put a lot of mad down inside my belly, just like it did your dad. Hmm, which is interesting, considering the amount of mad down inside Scoob's belly. Is putting mad down inside their kids' bellies just a thing dads do in Scoob's family? But, but you're not like my dad at all, Jima, he says, gasping at air. You smile a lot and laugh. Oh, I've let it get the best of me a time or two, she says. But unlike my daddy, I'm going to make things right 
before it's too late. That gives Scoob pause, and he wants to ask what she means, but before he can, she says, let's put out this fire. It is time to move forward. All right, and here's your preview. Chapter eight is called Onward. All right, guys, be well, be safe. Miss you very much. Talk to you tomorrow.